Check, check. Check, please. Cash your check. All right. I'll talk. I'll talk to the chair. It's all right. It, I wouldn't. I won't be the first one. Talk to an empty chair. I don't know. I don't know. Hey, have a seat. Thank you. I know. Every five minutes, I'm gonna. I'm gonna move seats. We gotta wait till the music. The music stops. Okay, good to be here. The Sabbath School was on YouTube as well. So if uh, you want to explore that. Uh, that's not my call. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I just was... I was doing it, so I just put it on because uh, I, I did it for uh, for my son. Uh, all right. So you can't trust these wayward elders doing all this stuff. Uh, all right, so we are on Chapter 8. And Chapter 8 is, I think, it might be the longest chapter in this book, so... I don't know that we're going to get through it, uh, but let's ask the Lord's blessing. We thank you, Father, for uh, another opportunity to study your word, that we can, uh, that your word could shape and mold us to be the people that uh, you have destined us to be, conform to the image of your Son. And uh, we thank you, Father, that uh, that's who defines us, as our, is, is who we are in Jesus, not our successes or our failures or our fumbles um, and our trials, but uh, who we are in Jesus. And uh, we pray that he'd be lifted up and clearly seen through uh, our study of this book. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So. Let's take a look here of chapter 8, Jesus' third lesson on the meaning of the cross. Um, <laughs> it, it, it really uh, finishes with a bang, so maybe we'll get there. We'll see. Jesus felt a tremendous temptation of his great popularity. Hmm. Ever think, think of that before? You know, there's a temptation, you know, there's lots of temptations, but to be able to handle this intense popularity where everybody's, everybody wants to talk to you and everyone wants to hear what you're saying and, and everything. No, it was, just, no, I'm sure. I mean, he, and, um, he's the man, Christ Jesus, you know, he was, one of us, and if, you know, temptation isn't conquered until it's faced, and he conquered every temptation. So he yeah, absolutely faced it. Um, and he faced it on a much higher plane than we ever have. You know, sometimes, you know, we, we, we're, we're tempted for five minutes and we give in. We have no idea what it's, right, what it's like to resist temptation, you know. But he, tempt, he resisted temptation continually on a steady pace, and he found victory because he, he you know. And we do, too, if we... All right. Should he ride the crest of the wave that was mounting upward, bearing him prominently to the pinnacle of national prestige and influence? Or should he arrest the movement of popularity by solemnly announcing the real truth of his messianic message, his coming sacrifice on the cross? This was no mystic secret revealed for an inner circle for a few close disciples. At the height of his ministry, 
when great multitudes went with him, he boldly proclaimed to them all the same testing truth. Luke reveals how he chose to present it with this ultra simple realism to the startled ears of the great multitude. Now all of us here are, are here to follow Jesus uh, and we want to encourage other people to do so, to find that, to find his rest, to find his peace and then to, be, to, to find his purpose and to be relevant, you know, and to uh, bring, bring gladness to his heart by how we live. But there's a path to this. And Jesus wants us to know what it is. <laughs> and he's telling us here, as, this, as he's telling the folks there, he turned, he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, don't blame me. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. It was, if, it was as if he said, I am glad to see you following me, but are you really sure this is your heart's choice? Because if you're in it for just the brownie points or you're in it for some kind of, you might find that the price might offset your selfish ambition. Uh, I must be plainly honest with you. I am indeed the Messiah, but not the one of popular hopes and expectations. I am indeed going to the kingdom of heaven, but mark you, my route lies via the cross. If you follow me, you must necessity, of necessity accept my route. Many will come. Many at some future time will mistake the God of this world for the Christ. I must ensure now that you do not mistake the Christ for the God of this world. What do you think? It's a, it's a high bar. Yeah. And maybe the more I do it, uh, like you mentioned with temptation, the, the more I do it, the, the easier that gets. And I think that's true about sanctification in general. You know, the more I make that willing action to be obedient to God, then it's, it's easier. But at the same time, it's the grace of God. So, yeah, my life has been that. And, it, and it's good. But this is a higher bar than, than usual, especially regarding my children. That, that's where. But then there's the prayer. Like, Lord, give me the grace to, you know, choose you above all else, like even my own life. So. Hmm. Any other thoughts? And there, there's a lot going on here, and I, 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 I got to be honest with you, right? I mean, I think they wanted, like, like a rosy pad full of earthly riches and enjoyments. The prosperity gospel, yeah. maybe? Yes. Self-sacrifice and pouring out your heart in selflessness, not selfishness. Hmm. Yes. Good points, both of you, yeah. There's a... There's a reality that exists because of the problem. The solution is what it is. Uh, and if we're not willing to acknowledge it and accept that first, then we have, we're very vulnerable to lies and deception and, and misunderstanding. So it requires rare preaching, seldom heard today, to leave the hearers thus free to decide. Who would like to take that section there? Let's, yeah, let's. It requires rare preaching, seldom heard today, to leave the hearers thus free to decide. But Jesus had no fear of the multitudes. He had faithfully preached the truth so faithfully, in fact, that his path was leading him directly to his own death. Why then need he fear to present the cross to the multitudes and to call for their decision? 
Only the man who himself bears the cross dares summon others to do so. What need had Christ to resort to any psychological subterfuge? The, the way of the cross had delivered him from any such helpless vanity. Okay, now, I just, I'm sorry to interrupt, but pay attention to these next couple of paragraphs. Since it is clear that a decision to accept the gospel is a decision to accept the cross, and since that decision can be made only by the inner heart of, the, of hearts, it follows that there must be no confusing pressure in true soul winning work. Simple truth needs no luring embellishments to make it attractive to the honest heart. In fact, such embellishments serve only to repulse the sincere seeker for truth who fails to discern the voice of the true shepherd and confusing appeals to self voiced by the wound by the would-be soul winner. Psychological tricks and egocentric inducements to decision can be the tool only of one who knows not the strength of the cross. Okay, let's talk about that. What do you see here? I think the Jews were very carnally minded. And Jesus is trying to explain things in a spiritual way, in a way. He, he said at one point, you know, if you don't drink my blood and eat my flesh, and a bunch of people left him because they didn't see the spiritual implication of that. They saw the carnal. So he uses, hip, hip, what is it, hyper, hyperbole? Mm -hmm. <laughs> hyperbole to exaggerate the point, uh, I think, to get attention of what, uh, what he's trying to shake out of them. And I know that uh, I've read about the Jewish history where they could not quite, uh, they could not put together uh, the book of Isaiah with all the different uh, speakings of this, of this Messiah. So they actually created two Messiahs. They had the Messiah ben Joseph and the Messiah ben David. One was a suffering servant, and one was a reigning king, you know, a conquering king. And so Jesus, I think Jesus has, is facing all this historical um, lack of spirituality, I suppose, in the Jewish, you know, mindset, the Israel mindset. So they're not looking for spiritual actually they're looking for a carnal earthly messiah hmm. any other thoughts the author seems to be in this section here saying there's many ways perhaps to get people to choose to be Christian or to get baptized or follow or to participate in Christian endeavor or community worship. Um, you know, they're, they're, one, of, one of them is guilt, right? Shame, these kinds of things. But most of the time, it's more subtle psychological tricks and egocentric inducements. Uh, I have heard many sermons in my days, and sometimes you'll, you can hear one where you're being talked into it, and it's into your own self best interest, best self interest to make this decision, you know, call people up to get baptized, an altar call. I don't, you know, altar call is great. I don't think there's anything wrong with them. You know, spirit, the spirit leads somebody to, to do one. Who, who are we to say, you know? Uh, but when an altar call is made, when a, when a crossless altar call is made, uh, when it's not pointing towards Christ and Him crucified, 
and the wonder of that all and what that all means and how that impacts and it doesn't impact your heart but the altar call is made you know get on up here and get right with God or else kind of thing you know you know it's, it's, this is so subtle message um, what it's saying here is that a clear decision to follow Christ is a clear decision to, to accept uh, to accept the cross and if you if you're drawn to Christ for what you can get out of him you're no longer going to be drawn once you don't feel or perceive that you're getting anything out of this you're going to divorce send them divorce papers because this isn't working for me but if your heart is captured because what you understand the principle of the cross uh, and, and God has his cross and stuff and other things we've studied, then perhaps that might secure the relationship and your ability to maintain relational integrity when trials come, you know, because we're all going to have a Gethsemane experience. <laughs> and... Uh, Sometimes we're, it's going to feel like God is far away. How do we handle that? If, if, if we're in it for what we're, we're getting and God's far away, we will betray him. But if, we, if our heart is connected and though he slay me, I will... Yeah, Job... I will not, you know. So uh, even if he kills me, I'm with him. I'm going to follow, you know, and that's the, one, of the, one of the defining characteristics of the final movement in Revelation is they follow the lamb wherever he goes, and some of these places are going to be unpleasant to the carnal mind, and maybe physically, uh, you know, tough. The reason the cross is the power of God and the salvation is that love alone has true drawing power. I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness I have drawn you. And this is what we were talking about in Ephesians 1 in Sabbath school. The truth being presented in God's full and unconditional acceptance of you as a person. I'm not talking about we're not talking about behaviors. We're talking about you personally as a person. He, 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 your full acceptance, your adoption, your, you belong to him even before you even knew it. In fact, it was already planned from the foundation of the world. You know? Uh, saint or sinner. You know? And... When this is seen, it draws us to him. Like, tell, we want to see more. We want to find out more. Who is, who is like this? Isn't that the question? Who is like God? Who, is li who do you liken me to? He asked the question. There's nobody like this. We could never come up with a God like this. We could sit around here for a thousand years and never come up with this. It's the greatest argument against evolution. We can have all this science, but this love is so amazing. It takes away, it, we, we can never come up with it. We can never evolve it. Uh, greatest argument for God. George Matheson, and, and listen to this, George Matheson authored a beautiful hymn, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go, has made the following apt comment. And if you get a chance, read that poem he wrote, uh, which it has a story behind it, which you can look it up if you want to. I understand the word drawn to be used here as the opposite of driven. If somebody's trying to drive you into loving them, what is your natural reaction? <laughs> you get a little bit on guard. This is drawing the heart through truth. I take the meaning to be, it is because I love you that I do not force you. 
I desire to win by love. Love is incompatible with the exercise of omnipotence. Mm -hmm. Interesting statement. Spot on, though, if you think about it. Love, uh, inexorable love can rule the stars, but the stars are not the object, an object of love. Man is an object of love, and therefore he can only be ruled by love, as the prophet puts it, drawn. Nothing is a conquest for love but the power of love, of drawing. Omnipotence can subdue by driving, but that's not a conquest for love. It is rather a sign that love is baffled. Whew, man. I sent this, I took a picture of this page and sent it to my kids and said, uh, you want to know why things are the way they are in the world? Here's the clue. I would read this three times to get, to get it, get your, your beginning to get your hands on it. God cannot use his power to, he can't like Dracula, you know, like come to me, you know, that kind of stuff. He, he, he has the muscles to do it, but love and force are incompatible. <clears throat> Therefore, it's impossible for him to drive you. Yeah, it's ridiculous anyway. Why do we feel that way? Why, why is it? Because we were made in the image of God and we see the absurdity of forced love. But it doesn't mean it isn't rampant. Forced love takes its way, take, takes its, you know, shows up in a lot of ways. I mentioned guilt and shame and, you know, uh, controlling people through psychological methods. Is that how God operates? He uses our guilt for our benefit, not to manipulate us. He takes the guilty soul and says, I have, I've got a solution for you. I can help. The devil points out all the, you know, God says, I know, you, I know you've got a problem. You're a mess. I can help. The difference, you know. Therefore, it is our Father. Therefore, it is that our Father does not compel us to come to Him. He would have us drawn by the beauty of holiness. Therefore, He veils all that would force the will. It's His character alone. And that's all Jesus would, you would employ when He walked the earth. Because he's the express image of who? <laughs> the Father, right? And this is the way the government of God is, 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 uh, is run. And this is genuine love, and this is very risky, isn't it? To give freedom like this? And we see the results of freedom, but you can't have you can't have genuine love. So he hides all that would force the will, even at a subliminal level. He hides the glories of heaven. He doesn't want you coming there because you, whoa, see that? That's a deal. I better grab it. You know, he conceals the gates of pearl and the streets of gold. He reveals not the river of his pleasures. He curtains from the ear the music of the upper choir. He forbids the striking of the hours on the clock of eternity. He treads on a path of velvet, lest the sound of his coming footsteps should conquer by fear the heart that ought to be won by love. <laughs> I just think this is over to, off the charts, you know. This is why the world's in the condition it is. Because God will not 
scare everybody into his camp. He can't. It's out of, it's, it, he will, I believe that he will go to the edge, but he will not cross that, he will not cross that barrier. You know, I mean, he wants so much, but he, to, to, to for us to, to be with him, but he's got to win us. Otherwise, heaven will be hell to us. Mm. And uh, a younger woman, maybe about 20, I think I'm not going to ever hear it before. She says, clutch time. And, my cu- and I, I, I sent the lyrics to her, too. So I've been sending this song out uh, last week, particularly to my aunt, who's in hospice right now. She's 85. I thought she'd be 85, but found out she had cancer six years ago. Yeah. And, and a life of, of, of a lot of whatever she wanted in her life. A life of riches. But an agnostic. What a beautiful heart, a gracious heart. So I thought, how could I, what could I send her? What, because you're right, it, this is right. This whole sense of, oh, love that will not let me go. It's such a draw for people. So I sent this to her, and then she sent, because they, they're they all kind of agnostic, and she said, oh, that's beautiful. So it's my hope and prayer that my aunt, God will be gracious, and, and my aunt will come to know the Lord through the mm. only Yes. You know, and that opens the door because she, 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 she saw that as being such a beautiful poetry. The same man wrote this. What do you think of this? You could send her this. Oh, oh, I like that. That's something to consider. Well, because he does. He brings out so much of it's just a beautiful. And it explains a lot. It explains a lot. God is not weak or unable to meet people's needs. He's not able to keep evil. For, it's not that he's uh, disabled and can't and has no desire to help people and he's, you know, he, whatever, right? That's what people think until they know. And that's, and, and this is the, and this is why, this is why, like we talked about in Ephesians chapter one, this is why the, we need to see the full scope that God's love encircles all humanity, not just a specific group that is responsive or might be responsive or something like that. It is, it is the, the gospel is good news for every human being. And every human being has been, has, is, is part of the in Christ motif. Uh, not just, to, you, you, we don't do something to, to, to get into Christ. We have to do something to get out of him. God has put us in him. Of God, of him, you are in Christ. It's God's work. It's not something that, it's not something we believe it, then God goes to work. God goes to work first, then he rests. You know? Or we, he goes to work first, and then he rests. We rest first, then we go to work. We go live the life. So, uh, Anyway, um, I, oh, I was going to say that I think I think this is the poet that lost his family at sea. Is this? I think is. I think I thought it was the fellow that wrote uh, "A Love That Will Not Let Me Go." But maybe I'm wrong. It is well. Yes, you're right. The, George is the. It's going to be on YouTube. So I'm, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Oh. Uh, but I think this is, George is the guy, he was engaged to, the, to a woman that he loved. He was very, very much in love with this woman. And he got stricken with blindness. Yes. There was some specific, real something special. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's one, okay. And he, he, uh, 
he, uh, I think he sent word he wanted to see her. And she came by train. And she said, I'm sorry, George, I can't marry a blind man. And he lost her. She let go of him. It busted him up pretty bad. And uh, he wrote, this, what came of that is, oh, love that will not let me go. Uh, all right. Next section, who wants to read that? Christ would rather draw by the cross than drive by the crown. The converts who come by way of the cross are those whom the Father draws. In his mysterious process of drawing, he doesn't want mere lip servers, but disciples who will follow the Lamb wherever he goes. The power of the drawing is in the truth, for Christ is the truth. If truth is made unmistakable, the power will prove to be invincible. Another way of saying the same thing is that the truth seeker and truth are made for each other. And when they meet, like crazy glue, they unite. <clears throat> On the other hand, the use of psychological and emotional techniques designed to force decision may attract an entirely wrong class of adherents who are neither, neither disciples nor followers of the Lamb. If decision is secured on the basis of naked self-interest, it cannot be a faith, and whatever is not of faith is sin. In the resultant confusion, the true shepherd's sheep may be turned away completely because they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This may be one reason why sometimes so few people respond to gospel invitations. Putting a stumbling block before Christ's little ones is surely sin, but Jesus said that his own sheep that his own sheep hear his voice. The sheep follow him for they know his voice. My own know me as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Those other sheep of Christ's fold therefore need not be persuaded to accept the gospel truth. Once the truth made known by the voice of Christ is clearly presented to them, no power in earth or hell can possibly dissuade them from following that voice. The winsomeness is in the truth itself because love and truth are inseparable. He who thinks he is speaking right doctrine but does not speak in love cannot be speaking truth. Mm -hmm. So another section that of, uh, of heaviness there. <laughs> Any thoughts? What sticks out to you there? I think it's really easy to get caught up in the mentality of win souls to Christ at any cost. You know? yeah. And I think that it's a fatal deception that the enemy tries to plant because he, he kind of like means it as you're doing something good. You're bringing somebody to Christ when you're really doing it in the wrong way. And that could probably impact their salvation in a detrimental way in the future. The, uh, the well said, the... Uh, the attribute, the principal attribute of Satan's kingdom, of Satan's character, is, is the lifting up of self, self-preservation, self-improvement in a sense that uh, what's in it for me? The me thing, right? The lifting up of self. And we read about it, you know, I will do this, I will this, I will rise here, I will, and everybody's going to be about me. Um, and when we draw people into the church by using that method, we are weakening the church. Now, all of us came to Christ because the Lord pointed out to us our need. We saw ourselves as sinners, and God uses that bring us to Christ. Okay, so, there, so we don't want to dismiss the whole thing because we, we start somewhere, but eventually we are, we are held by something much more than self-preservation. If we, if we 
continue our Christian experience in self-preservation, we become the classic Laodicean, rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. So, be careful how I say some of this stuff. <laughs> um, we're, we're oftentimes those who are truly truth seekers are turned off by the appeals for self-centeredness, of self-centeredness. They will not respond to that. So you're making altar calls and at any call, bring them in and hey, if you gotta, if you've got to use worldly ways to do it, and I know they're you. I'm in sales, and I've seen salesmanship at the, <laughs> at evangelistic series. Um, when that is utilized, those methods are utilized, they drive away those who are seeking, that are generally trying, looking to respond to the shepherd's voice. They don't hear the shepherd's voice in that. And that's what's being brought out here. So it could be counterproductive. And now you load your church up with people who are just seeking for, they're looking for the candy and the ice cream, right? How does a church, um, how does a true church um, beware of that? How, well, these meetings, but how does a true church make sure that that's not happening? I'm thinking maybe a, a preacher who would, well, I think Pastor kind of is really good at talking about years ago in other histories of, of churches, you know, we had that repent, which is part of it. But you can't forget the attribute of God that is love, but, you know, yeah, there's a lot of churches out there and they're probably around here that are doing it for different reasons. But. Tip, I mean, basically the, the, the Christian church and, you know, the mega churches or stuff that are basically here to meet the needs of people um, I don't want to. I don't want to sound harsh, but but they're here to meet the needs of people, not call them to repentance, not call them to follow the cross or to understand it, but for their own. You know, trying to. They're, they're looking to feed and feed a need, and and we should be able to fill a need too. You know, uh, but the but but draws people. What draws true seekers to the true shepherd is truth. Not psychological tricks of here, here, you know, this, it's on sale. Buy before midnight tonight, you know. Uh, those, those tactics work. But they don't bring people to the true shepherd, who is, as we see, anyone want to be my disciple? If he, doesn't, if he doesn't forsake all and take his cross, he cannot be my disciple. And, you know, so we got another section here. Can the love of self also include love of family? Mm hmm. This is an interesting section. Who's got this? You got this? If Jesus' words to the multitude sound a bit hard, we must know that he was not teaching an attitude of harsh, unfeeling hatred toward one's loved ones in the family circle. The biblical meaning of the word hate is to love less in comparison. An illustration of what he meant can be found in his attitude toward his own mother and relatives. He tenderly loved his mother, and even in his desperate hour on the cross was thoughtful for, of her needs. His was a perfect example of fili fil filial devotion. 
However, he would permit no family tie, however intimate, to lessen his devotion to all suffering, needy members of the human family. On one occasion, he was helping the multitudes. His relatives arrived. Then his mother and brothers came to him, and he could not approach them because of the crowd. And it was told him by some who said, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Here was no spurning of the tender affections of kin, but rather a recognition that these affections must not become perverted through a failure to love all needy members of the human family. It is a deep lesson that many of us need to grasp who instinctively feel that our charity can be confined within the narrow walls enclosing precious kinfolk or close friends. Love of family and pride of blood can be a very difficult form of the old man the old man assumes when God calls us to do something or to go somewhere for him and we say no because of the ties of kinsmanship that bind us here is the old man alive and well love for those who potentially will hear the word of God and do it will prevail even as Jesus heeded the call to come to save us but when a call comes to leave father, mother, brother, sister, and other cherished ties of the homeland to go to a distant land in service for Christ, self often protests. Seldom is it seen that rejection of duty is a rejection of the cause. Okay. Anything to share there? Why? Well, because we have the responsibility. Because I think the Lord, I mean, we have a responsibility to our families to love them, take care of them. But, like, in what instance? Would it be right to put what do they mean, go out and be like a missionary and leave your family? You know, like, like a, uh, for instance, like a pastor who's always, who's not giving his family attention or his wife attention, but is always at church and always in, is that right? I mean, I don't know, I could be wrong, but I don't, I don't see that that's, that's what's the hard thing, because I don't know what, what the right thing is. Hey. What do you think? Any thoughts on that? You're right, it's a hard thing. I think what Jesus is saying is that if you truly are being led by the Holy Spirit and you know that, and you know that it is a true calling and you use your family as an excuse to not do it, maybe that's not completely... Um, Being in service for the Lord, if you really believe that that's where you should be, would be hard to throw away, I think. And I think it could be a struggle with family. Um, I know I even think about the missionaries going to dangerous places, you know, like Turkey, <laughs> and bringing their children. You know, we're helping them do that. It's just... They, they, they believe they have a calling to do that. And they're not looking at the danger or anything like that for the family. So I think if, if someone just has a kind of a flimsy um, idea that God is calling them and I, sh I want to do this, but it's not a true calling, and I guess that's where the sheep hear his voice, yeah. So. And I, I, I think it can be a, I, I think it can be a, a both and, and even as I think, you know, with women, we are more tied to taking care of our children, but it seemed with Jesus there was that both and. He was able to still love his family and still 
go to do the service he was called to, but that was the priority. And I feel like God takes care of, of our family in the process of that. I've been called out of my family in, in many ways and have had to um, do that, and, and God fills in. Of course, your mother and your brother are here in this room, so th there's that. And, but if there's a real special need, then I do feel you know, God would allow me, and he'd, he'd make that work. But at the same time, I struggle with it too, you know, being a woman, yeah. I think there's people that are called that have such a burden to say help other people in certain ways, and they're capable of doing that, and they can hardly turn away from it. It seems to me that their children or their family maybe would understand that. Maybe. <laughs> So I don't know. Got anything? I don't know. I think that sometimes we see these things on the surface, like on a piece of paper, like follow Christ, and we just we have no idea what that really entails. And like Jesus is telling us that there's going to come times where I want you to maybe even forsake your own family because of the importance of the work we're doing. I just don't. You know, you brought up a pastor, you know, and what is, uh, you know, there's a balanced life there. A pastor is ordained, hopefully called to preach the gospel. Uh, so it's kind of an inverse thing with, with somebody in that situation. They've got to be careful not to neglect their family in the process. God, that Jesus is not suggesting that we neglect our family. He is suggesting that we have a pecking order of who the boss is. It's not my spouse. It's him. It's not the needs of my kids. It's him. Now, if I can, if I can come to that first and trust that he's not going to want me to neglect my kids or my spouse, but that I put him first, that I think is step one. Once we get there, now we, 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 can, we can see where the, the Lord's put us in a certain places to serve him to serve the church, to serve the community of faith that we belong to. And uh, we are not to let anybody get in the way of that, including a spouse or kids or parents or whatever. Um, especially early on, you know, my wife had some kind of like serious, uh, she had some objections to what was referred to in our home as the God thing, you know. And it was very difficult for me. Um, and it persisted for quite a while. Um, but I just said, I have got to do this. I have duties. This is not a duty to the church. This is a duty to Christ. Because it was always the church, the church, and I'm just like, well, the church is the playground, but I'm not obliged to the playground. I'm obliged to the leader at the playground. And uh, so that, did, that was not met with a pat on the back, okay, no worries. Uh, but I trusted God to deal with that. Um, 
so I learned to keep my eyes on him even though I was not, it wasn't a welcome situation. And, that, and that, it, just wasn't, it just wasn't about coming to church or, or going to board meetings. I mean, we, we met in person back then or uh, stuff. Finally, you know, finally she came around uh, bec- and I think that was God. And, 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 I, and I told, you know, I said, this is, this is duty, this, this is the right thing, this is, it makes me a better person to obey this call, you know. Uh, and it could, and it was just in the smallest things, like I said, a, you know, just coming to church or going to a business meeting or elders meeting or whatever I had to do at the time, you know, or constituency or something like that. But it finally got to the point where I, I mean, I was afraid, you know. <laughs> I got this little woman at home, but I was afraid because, you know, I, I can be hurt by this person. And, uh, but, but this is, I did read this book early on in my Christian experience. And, uh, And also in, in the book Early Writings, I think it's the chapter on the latter rain or the Laodicean message or something like that. Something comes and people that have been have stepped back because of family and family ties. I mean, if you're in a in a in a strong traditional family of some sort, you know, and you step out of that, you you know, in, in certain countries especially, but in, even in certain cu- cultures around here, it wasn't the case for me, but but I know that this exists that. Uh, this is a real big deal. And it was talking about the, 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 when, the ro- when the latter rain is falling in your life, and it can happen on an individual basis, you know, because it's the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. It's just, a, it's just a, it's a large measure, but it can happen. You know, little people are, are experiencing the latter rain all around us. What God wants to do is incorporate into a large swell. Anyway, if you're if the Holy Spirit and you you trust God to work this out, um, and He's leading, then then it's in His hands. And and, and early writings talks about when the when the latter rain falls in your life. You will lose the fear of family, the fear of your employer, the fear, all these, you know, all these things that kind of keep you locked up in a, you know, in a, in a comfort zone of discomfort, in a place where you're not as effective as you could be. When those fears drop off, people will be coming all over, people will be coming, loading into the, into the community together. And it will be, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you're not going to be able to ask them to do too much. They're just going to be wanting to serve in some way, you know. It's that verse in the Psalms, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear what the man go into. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, it's different when it's your spouse, you know, or your kids, or, you know, if you're younger, it's your parents. Uh, but it's the still principle still applies, right? And 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 I had to make it. I just had to make a stand that this is my. I need to do this. And if you need to go get an attorney over this, okay, but I'm still doing it. And I, you know, I took a lot of heat from it for it for a while. Uh, it took a little while, but. Uh, Exactly. And the Lord blessed my wife when I when I made the when I when I was just like made up my mind I'm I'm willing to take whatever heat I got to take. My, the Lord would bless my wife. So it was an interesting thing. It was an interesting dynamic that I can't go into. But anyway. 
All right. But love of self can also manifest itself in fear of their faces, of our spouse or children or parents or whatever. I was just going to say that he tells us that he's made all nations of one blood. And, I, you know, God sees us all intermingled in a sense. God sees one, one race. He sees one family. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, we are our brother's keeper to a point where we can help. You know what I mean? To what degree that comes into the family, of course, is individual. But um, I think he, he, he wants us to see that our family is not just you. Mm-hmm. It's also you. I have no sisters, but I do. You know what I mean? Because yeah. he says, you know, who is my mother, my brother? You know, so. Right. Um, so the, the idea here is that no human being, no matter how close they are to you, is dictating to you to not follow through on your duty to Christ and to community of believers. And if you've got to take heat, you take the heat. All right. Uh, Jesus' entire life was devoted to service, even from childhood. Would you like to take that? It was, it was his to taste all the suffering and privation that we humans can know. Although many rejected him, there were those who listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit and were drawn to him. And there were worshipers of self who belonged to Satan's kingdom who did not respond to the drawing. Eventually, all would show on which side they stood. And thus, throughout time, everyone passes judgment on himself. There will be a day of final judgment when every lost person will understand why he is outside. In the final encounter, as on a screen, the cross will be presented, and its real bearing will be seen by every mind that has been blinded by sin. When the lost see Calvary with its mysterious victim, sinners will condemn themselves. People will see what their final choice has been. If we refuse a call to difficult service for our master because of our love of family or for our own selfish reasons, there can be no lighter sentence awaiting us eventually than if we reject Bible truth for similar excuses. In either case, it is the cross which is being rejected rather than either doctrine or service. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. It's calling it as it is. And this is good because we can repent. You know, you... If you're living in la-la land and, and unaware of this or you've been in denial, uh, having it brought to our frontal lobes gives us the opportunity to be healed. This is, I've been doing this. This is how, it, how it's been. And uh, the Lord knows this already. He's not going to fall off his throne if you tell him. <laughs> uh, but uh, now there's healing in his wings, right, for us. Any thoughts on this, on what we've read so far today? What's the difference between my heart responding and somebody else that's in a similar situation and their, their heart just doesn't respond? Like, you know what I'm saying? What is the, the, what is the difference you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody else. They just like, why me? Like, why? Why did I respond and they not respond? I mean, I know sin, but I mean, there's got to be something deeper than that. You know what I'm saying? Wow. There's a question. I don't know if I'm qualified to answer, but there is a, there's the mystery of godliness. Why do some respond? And there's the mystery of iniquity. Why do some not? 
so I've often asked myself the same question because I've run into people I haven't seen in years and seen the trajectory of their lives. And uh, I think back of the things that, 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 how the dots connected for me. Why did the dots connect th like that and the dots for them connect like that? And I don't know that I have ever really reconciled that in my mind. There is, this book is diagnosing, I think, principles as to why. Uh, it's rejection of the cross where self is crucified. And it's an ultimate rejection is how people are lost but I mean I'm it's not like I I leave here and and every moment of every day from the next time I see you will be just a series of embracing the cross and self being crucified in my life that every thought has been ca is captive to Christ I wish I could say that's the case but I'm in the process of being fixed <laughs> And refined, uh, and that's if that's 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 what I desire, and when and in that in the moments I catch myself being out of that, out of out of tune with that, and I catch myself, I recognize it. At least some of the time I do. You know. Uh, I think I recognize it almost all the time, but I, you know, I mean, you're blind to your own nuts, knuckleheadness, you know. Uh, but we're, we're being refined and we're growing and, and this is happening. Now, the path of the righteous are, are, is like what? Up until noonday, right? So it's like the dawn, you get a little sliver of light coming up and you just see a little bit, the, the darkness starts to break on the horizon and you just see a little bit of that. And as, if we welcome more light, we get more light. If we do not and we stop, we stop receiving light and God has to keep bringing us around the same ground until we do. And so, so sometimes people have, can be in the, like the Corinthians, Second Corinthians is written to people. I think, that, I think the two letters are 20 years apart. The second letter is like, what is the deal with you people? <laughs> All this time, you know, you're acting like children. You're acting like mere men, is what Paul writes. Basically saying, you're, you're, you're just like unbelievers. It's like, this, it's like none of this ever happened. You know? I came to you, and uh, you would, you'd, you'd give me your, your, when I came to you, you'd like give me your, my, you'd give me your very eyes, you would say. I think that's the Corinthians. And now... You know, you're squabbling and you're suing each other and people are, there's sexual misconduct and like, what is this? And uh, so I, I don't know if that's the best answer, but that's the only answer I have. And uh, as soon as we arrest and stop accepting the light that God's pleased to give us, we, we, be, we stagnate. And, and I don't know, I don't understand why, you know, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you just don't understand why people don't embrace him. The mystery of iniquity. Uh, it just doesn't make sense when your eyes are opened to, to, to want to, to willfully be blind. It's like, and, and Paul says, it's kind of like being under a spell. It's being bewitched. The Galatians were bewitched, he says, with another gospel. They were even being religious. <laughs> but, uh, so there's just this, and, and uh, the Old Testament talks about it being sorcery. 
I mean, it's, there's something really wrong with being sick, you know, being, being, being with someone trying to tell you you're sick, completely denying it, and then not wanting to have anything to do with the solution, and, and then dying. That's mentally ill. And our minds get captivated by demonic influences and, uh, and ide ideas, you know. That's basically, you know, there's all these demonic ideas and they're all crazy. And uh, we adopt them. And, uh, How do you think that prayer for someone who's lost would, would help that? I mean, I know partially, but just to kind of explore that with all of you. Well, first of all, who's the lost? I mean, you're talking about like their behavior is taking them to a lost place? Uh, um, well, people who aren't saved, but also people who maybe have been saved and they're not accepting that light in a way that they're getting a sanctification. I, I say that because I, my, my grandmother was such a, a prayerful person and I see her influence in, in my family's life. We spent more time with her. I, I sometimes think that the mercy of me being saved was was people who were praying for me and God gave me that mercy based on their prayer because I wasn't leading a life. I, we, we can't all know the whole tapestry of how we got saved, but I, I suppose there's a variety of things, but, but prayer certainly is something that, that I would think would be a, a helpful thing for someone. That when, when you say saved, are you, are you, are you speaking uh, being saved from the... The uh, the penalty of sin, or or the power and slavery to sin, or the very presence of sin. Which one? Um, I would say the ability to sin. I don't. I don't know. I I'd have to really think about that. Well, well here's why I, I ask. Be because the well, the reason I ask yeah. is the way you phrased sure. your response. And we discussed this in, in Ephesians 1 in Sabbath school. The Bible tells us very clearly that we have been historically saved. It tells us very clearly that we, in the present continuance tense, we are being saved. And then it also tells us that we will be saved. And it's kind of like, well, which one is it? These... Okay. Uh, and that saves you from which three? Or all three? Because the scripture says, and we talked about it today, and this, the Christian church has been wrestling with this. We talked about Calvinism, we talked about Arminianism, we talked about Universalism, and we talked about the gospel which is not in any of those three. I mean, it, it's not the full package. The full package is not in any of those three. Each of them have an element of the gospel in there, but they also have elements that all of a sudden water it down and, and create all kinds of confusion because don't, they don't match up. The pieces don't fit together, which is why Mrs. White was so ec ecstatic about what Jones and Wagner were we're sharing because this is it. This is what I've been talking about. This is the clearest presentation that I've that have come from human lips, except for this, uh, or this the clearest presentation uh, that I've ever heard, except for conversations between me and my husband just before he died. And he, there was a major transformation going on in uh, in her husband's just before he died. Um, and then she was despondent and depressed because she thought this was going to lead to something. And then she had a vision that God is going to raise others to bear this torch. And then when she heard Wagoner, she said, this is it. This is what the pro God promised. So then she wrote that statement. God 
in his great, the Lord in his great mercy sent that most precious message to Elder Jones and Wagoner. It presented Christ in such def defining aspects and broadness that it will capture the heart of pe the pe hearers, and, and not just in the church, but worldwide, and that uh, it'll lead to uh, obedience to Christ, and particularly his law. It'll create Sabbath keepers worldwide. <laughs> not because, you know, look at the Ten Commandments, but it'll be, look at this presentation of who Christ is. Christ leads to repentance. And this is the message God commanded to be given to the world. So what was that? The first is that God has historically saved every human being in Christ. If we choose to believe that, now we are armed. We, are, we, are, we have utility to be able to fight and be delivered from the power of sin. We can make choices to be delivered from the power of sin. We're saved there. But that the first one doesn't require consent. The first one's an act of grace. The second one is, requires our consent. The third one is that the second coming of this corruption puts on incorruption. So the reason why this is relevant, right? the practical sense, when I pray for somebody, I am praying for somebody who is in Christ. It doesn't matter who they are. They're bad people, but God has wrapped his arms around them. And he has, and, and it, is it chapter, I think it might be chapter two of Ephesians, he continues on. He has made all of us one. He's gathered us together in one. And he uses uh, as, a, as a pattern, he uses the, uh, the Jews and the Gentiles, which is basically believers and unbelievers, you know, in union with Christ. Um, so because every human being has been purchased and been saved in the life of Christ, because of this, we can pray for that person because they're not on the outside. They're on the inside. God has absolute... So when I pray for you, I'm not praying for something apart from me because we are bound together in Christ. You see? So God has the absolute right to respond to that prayer on behalf of that other person. You see? And that's... And so in, 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 it goes into... It, Paul goes into marriage, to use the marriage as an example, all these examples. So now when we pray for somebody, we're not praying for the unsaved. We're praying for the saved to come to faith and repentance so that they can experience that salvation and not to turn their back on it and be lost. You see? So you don't do something to be saved. You actually do something to be lost. Right. Yes. Yes, that's why I said lost when you started with that. Mm -hmm. Because they're, yeah, it's an opt out or opt in, but it's it's actually you're opting out because they're already in. Christ is yes. Christ. It, God has put us in the Christ and opted us in. Good way to put it. Yeah. So we, that, that gives me um, more encouragement. It inspires me to, to pray for everybody, you know, not just people that I think might get there or while they're getting close, but for really well. Yeah. So the final generation, you know, there's people are concerned, whatever, last generation theology and stuff like that. I don't want to get into that. But there's a, there is a generation that grows to the fullness and the measure of the stature of Christ in Revelation. They follow him wherever he goes, like we said. Right? They, there's no guile in their mouths. On and on and on. And why aren't they the only ones saved then? If they are the full maturation of this, if they fully, if, if, 
if their maturation process is to fully the, the travail of his soul that's talked about in Isaiah, Isaiah 53, you know, this is what the sacrifice of Christ is, was designed and destined to produce, and here they are. They show up on the world stage, you see? 144,000. Why aren't they the only ones saved? Because they're not 144 individuals. They represent the human race. They represent this. We are Adam. <laughs> We're one. So God, is, by, by producing 144,000, God has redeemed, in a, in, a, in a practical sense, he's redeemed all the humanity that, that, that those who chose to believe, all of them through, a, through mature, maturation would come to this level, you know? So in a, it's compared to like a plant, you know, a plant comes out, it's gonna be a, a, a daisy, you know, and it comes out of the ground and it's this big and it's not, doesn't look too impressive, but is it still a daisy? Is there anything wrong with it? It just hasn't matured. Right? And then when it gets up and it, you see the daisy, you know, but it always was a daisy. And Adam, the new, the, the new human race in, the, in Christ, is going to reach its fulfillment. We're invited to participate, to believe the good news. Isn't he referred to as the new man? The new man. The new man. Um. I was thinking about praying for other people. Maybe the prayer could be that we should pray that someone comes to the understanding that they have already been saved. They've been and, accepted in the and beloved. To, and yeah. that they have been accepted in the beloved already. And Mrs. White makes a statement that's similar to the Ephesians 1, 8, where God, God's, God did not save humanity by going outside of, of himself. He, he saved them through bringing them together in, into himself. That's the language she uses, and that bringing together is redemption. So there's a universal aspect involved here. So It doesn't apply to everybody when it comes to being saved from the power of sin, because that re requires consent. Or or the very presence of sin, which is the ultimate, when Jesus returns, doesn't apply to them, everybody there, because that requires the consent to stage two to lead us to stage three. At some level, you don't have to be completely delivered from the power of sin, you know? I mean, the thief on the cross is an example, you know? He was, he, he was delivered from the power of sin in his mind, and he died. He didn't have an opportunity and, you know, whatever. You can get into nitty-gritty here, but, but, but the first stage has, God has set a platform upon which he can build and deliver us from the power of sin with our consent and ultimately bring us what is, we're, we're in the twinkling of an eye. You know, we're say, we're, 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 our, our very natures are, are, are Tra transformed and we're saved in the, into a f unfallen human nature. So you've got a, pr a, a, a situation where there's a platform where we are given a probationary time. We're saved from the penalty of sin. So you weren't saved when you believed. You were saved at the cross. <laughs> and that's what Ephesians is talking about in the past tense at a specific time at a specific place. So. Because universalists, they make a mistake with that. They say from the power and the presence. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, everybody's saved by Christ. They don't even have to make a choice. So they're, they're, they're believing what you say, but they're not. There's an element, there's an element of truth, but it, yeah. it, <laughs> it, it blows up somewhere. It yeah. does. There's, there's, yeah, there's, there's more to it. One leading A to B to C. 
Yeah, and then therefore, therefore I don't need it to be. I don't need to have a transform. Uh, yeah. I don't need my mind to be transformed by the by the power of the Holy Spirit, like you know, which all all the scriptures that talk about that are just ignored now. They don't even have to take up the cross. And they don't right. Have to change their life, and, they and if really get to know the true Christ. You know, if if all if really what your concern is your eternal eternal security, you're just kind of concerned about that. You're not really concerned about the honor and vindication of the Savior, which is what our deliverance from the power of sin is a, is a way that vindicates God, right? Because it shows his care, it reveals his character. If you're not concerned about that, then you like that universalism, you know? Right. Yeah, you can't see the kingdom if you're not born again because you, you, won't, you won't be able to see it. You won't recognize it. it it's more than just a physical thing. It's a, it's a visionary thing. I mean, it's both, you know, but you won't see it. You won't grasp it. You won't understand it. You don't get, you don't get it without spiritual eyes. You have to be born again. Or you cannot see the kingdom of God. And you will run for the nearest exit if you find yourself there. Uh, but that is the the that is the the born again experience is and 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 every everybody I'm sure there's a pattern, but everybody's maybe you know you know what comes first faith or repentance you know what comes first being repenting and then being born again well you can't you can't repent a repentance is a gift so you must have the Holy Spirit first <laughs> so there 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 must be some kind of there's, there's something that happens in the human heart or human soul that opens itself up to God that, that somehow responds to his call, to his draw. And all that little opening is all that God needs. And he steps into there. And, and if we continue to open up, he starts to show things to us. And we experience repentance. You know, but until that time, you know, we can't repent without the Holy Spirit. So there has to be some kind of thing. Our faith does not bring him in. Our faith simply puts our weapon away from fighting him. So there's a, so there's a, there's a ceasing instead of a doing, you know? And we, we rest in the truth. We start, somehow the truth penetrates somewhere, somehow. And it, it doesn't need to be the whole kit and caboodle. It's just a little glimmer of light, you know? And with that, I think we need to stop. Hmm? The air went off. Want to close us with a prayer? Sure. Lord, thank you for my brothers and my sisters here, Lord, this family you've given me where I, I did understand and could feel the love that you have uh, for me, Lord, and, and been drawn mm. to closer to you. And Lord, may, may that be true of all of us here, that you continue to draw us in this church, Lord, and, and even the people we meet every day, that we can be an example and, and help us. We know that you're a part of helping us to give up ourselves and, and come closer to your cross, that you even do that for us. And so we thank you. Watch over my aunt at this time who is, is doing just what has been described here, Lord. And we thank you for your mercy and grace over our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, all right, thanks for hanging around. Yeah, yeah it was wonderful. Uh, we have these books. 15 seconds. These books are coming. We're going to hand these out. It's from the 1888 Message Study Committee. It's uh, kind of a, an overview of a lot of things. And uh, so we're going to hand them out to everybody at church. If somebody on YouTube wants this, uh, get a hold of somebody here or call me if you know how to reach me or put it in the comments or I don't know, something. And uh, 
and we'll make sure that everybody who wants one gets one. Uh, it's about 50 pages long, and it has uh, uh, the president of the uh, of the uh, committee uh, puts a little has a little statement in here, and then there's uh, uh, different things. The savior of all men. The committee writes a thing here on that. Uh, E.J. Wagoner, the free gift. A.T. Jones, the first Adam, a figure of Christ, and uh, danger of false ideas on justification by faith by, by uh, Ellen White. There's an article in here by W.W. Uh, Prescott, Christian Experience, things like that. There's a timeline, uh, updates and ongoings of the committee. Uh, and so there's different stuff in here that can be shared that, that it might be just interested in reading. I think you'll find this to be a real blessing. So look for this maybe next week. It might be here at church or the following week. I will not be here the next two weeks. Uh, I'm going down to this conference next Sabbath. And then uh, I've been invited to the cover for a pastor the following Sabbath after that. So I think the next time I'll be here is the end of the month. Yeah, 29th, yeah. That's what you said tomorrow. I am, yeah. Well, unless we find someone else who wants to cover it, but um, for right now. That's what you said. <laughs> so, um, so we'll maybe finish this chapter whenever that time comes and take it from there, okay? Okay. All righty. Jeremy, can you put these uh, chairs back for me and set up pulpit and all that? I'm going to turn it up. Uh, yeah, I guess I do. Or do we keep them? Where do we keep them? Do we keep them down here or up there?